we just said the Shema, um, to focus on the, the oneness of Hashem. We're going to come back to that idea. Before we do, we'll say our blessing for our learning. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah It's been three weeks and three weeks of a lot of uh, dramatic progress in the Torah um, as we were going through these Parshas. So I not only did I miss uh, learning with you, but missing some of the, the highlights and the splitting of the sea. But here we are, um, at least we're here for Parshat Yitro, which is the giving of the Ten Commandments. And also Yitro, who we know is uh, Moshe's father-in-law, who comes to join with the Jewish people after he hears about everything that happened to the Jewish people after the attack by Amalek, all of the wonders that were done at the sea. And he comes and joins in. So what we're going to talk about first is, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we, we function in the Torah the way I function in time, which is I live by the calendar page. You know, when it's one month, it's that month, and I don't necessarily connect it so much to the month that's coming. So the fact that this is January 31st and tomorrow's February 1st, did I get that right? It's like, it's a whole new page, but the days do come next to each other. And the Parshas also come next to each other. So we want to go back for a moment and take a look at the end of last week's Parsha, last week's Parsha of Bishalach, of the splitting of the sea. And after the splitting of the sea, we had, hold on a second, we'll turn to it. Just a moment. We're going to turn back to, uh, in the Chumash, it'll be, page 393, actually go back to 391. 391, which is Shemot, Exodus, chapter 17, verse 8. Chapter 17, verse 8, page 391. Hold on one second, let me just let somebody in here. Hold on. After the splitting of the sea, the Jewish people are attacked by Amalek. And verse 8 begins, Amalek came and battled Israel and Rephidim, Moshe said to Joshua, choose people for us and go do battle with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. As many of you may know, the fact that we have Amalek and the Torah describes what is to be done to Amalek as far as destroying every man, woman, and child of Amalek, that that was brought against us at the Hague. Um, in the, um, the trial of Israel, saying that that proves that we had genocidal intentions against um, the Palestinians because we did compare Hamas to Amalek, which is true. Um, they are Amalek, not every Palestinian. So it's interesting. I'm like, oh, they become big Torah scholars when they want to, that they find most Jewish people don't even know about Amalek and what it says in the Torah, but they knew that. Okay, so this is the first battle of Amalek who comes purely to destroy. That is their only intention. It's not over land, it's not over power, it's not over anything other than the Jewish people's existence. But Amalek comes to attack whenever we, if we look at it historically, it's either at times of profound weakness of the Jewish people, spiritual weakness, or when we're on the verge of accomplishing something great. And they come to be like that force that tries to intervene and prevent us. So the Jewish people were in both places. Because if you remember, plan A, God's plan A was exodus from Egypt, split the sea, and then go to Mount Sinai to get the Torah. So Amalek has a motivation, an Amalekite motivation, to stop the Jews, to destroy the Jews on the way to receiving the Torah. So this is when they come in. And at the same time, here the Jewish people are at this momentous occasion. And at the same time, they are in a place of spiritual weakness because what they had said right before Amalek comes, if you just turn back again to page 391, hold on one second, I just need to let someone in. Right before what, what directly preceded Amalek coming, was the statement on 391, right at the end of verse seven, where it says, is Hashem among us or not? The Jewish people were like, is Hashem with us or not? That this place of doubt and lack of emunah, 
that they were coming from. It says that this provided um, the, the entry point for Amalek to come in. Because when the Jewish people are united, when our emuna, our faith and trust and knowing of God's, um, you know, existence and guidance of us is strong, it acts as a, like your immune system, it protects us. When that weakens, we become susceptible to attack. So the status of the Jewish people um, being strong prevents attack, and when we are weak, it invites attack. So the Jewish people are at a place of weakness, and Amalek comes in to attack. And the result at the end is the reading that we have um, on Purim. Uh, let's see. They not want to rob riches. No, they did not want riches. They wanted to kill. It was not about money. It wasn't about power. It was just about Jews. It was like, get rid of Jews. So it was not that at all. Um, and they didn't really have all that much. Um, they certainly had less than, so this was not anything. In fact, no other nation was even, was, was they were in such awe of the Jewish people uh, because of the miracles that God had performed for them that all the other nations stayed clear away. And the Jewish people were, they were, didn't have any designs on anybody. They were going to Mount Sinai to get the Torah. So that was the plan A. So they do fight, and Joshua is in charge of um, leading the battle against Amalek. And when you get to page 393, verse 14, this is chapter 17 of Exodus, verse 14, Hashem said to Moshe, write this as a remembrance in the book, meaning in the Torah, and recite it in the ears of Yehoshua, that I shall surely erase the memory of Amalek from under the heavens. Moshe built an altar and called it, Hashem is my miracle. And he said, for the hand is on the throne of God. Hashem maintains a war against Amalek from generation to generation. And we all know that um, song that we sing at our Seder. In every generation, they rise up to kill us and God saves us. So this in every generation that there is an Amalekite force that tries to destroy the Jewish people. When it says there, for the hand is on the throne of God. So it says, which hand? It says the hand of Amalek is on the throne of God. And for this now, we need to look at the Hebrew. It's the last full line in the Hebrew. If you're looking in a regular Chumash, um, next to the little letters Tet Zion, it says, Vayomer ki yad, the hand, al case ya. Al case means the throne. Ya is the yud He are the first two letters of God's four-letter name. God's four-letter name is yud He and vav He, which we pronounce Adonai. But sometimes we use Ya. We sometimes we use that name when we say the word Hallelu Ya. That means give praise to Ya to God. So that is what's saying here is all case Ya but it's not the full name of Hashem. So we have an idea that as long as Amalek is present and has not been destroyed, that Amalek's hand is on the throne of God. And that throne, that the word for throne, it should be kise, but instead it says case. So the spelling of throne is not complete. It's case instead of kise, it's minus a letter. And ya is minus two letters. It should be yud he vav he, and it's only yud and he. So al case ya on the throne of God, the God's throne is diminished, meaning the Jewish people are diminished, Torah is diminished, God's name is diminished when Amalek forces are rising up. We know that we talk about the name of God being complete. Every service we have ends with aleinu, and we say. God will be the king of all the world by Yom Hahu. And on that day, he will be one and his name one, meaning that the name will be put together. It won't be just the Yud and He, it'll be Yud He Vav He. Now, we say God's name. We don't, we say the Adonai, we say the full name. But what we're saying is that at a spiritual level, it's like is God's name is not together because the world is not together. 
when the world is together and the Jewish people are together and everything is the way it's supposed to be, this is then God's name will be complete. That's how we end the service. That's our affirmation. It's like our pledge of allegiance, our pledge of allegiance. So until then, it's called Kesia. It's called that the um, Amalek's hand is on the throne of God. So here comes our first gematria. The gematria of Kesia, the throne of God, this, this throne that is being impacted. So the word case is Chaf Samach. And so that's Chaf is 20 and Samach is 60. So 60 plus 20 is 80. And yeah, Yud Hey, Yud is 10 and Hey is 5. So it's 15. 15 plus 80 equals 95. Little interjection here. This Shabbos is Shabbat Mavorchim Adar Risho. This is the Shabbos when we are going to announce the coming of the new month of Adar. Adar this year, there are going to be two Adars because it's a leap year. However, what do we know? Mishanichnas Adar is when Adar comes in, Marbim Basimcha, our Simcha increases. So there is a question, does it also increase on Adar 1 or just not until Adar 2? Because Purim, thankfully, is not happening until the second Adar. The first Adar is going to be like, a instead of an echo, it's going to be a prequel. A prequel to the second Adar is the first Adar. But this, this Shabbos, it says as soon as you announce that Adar is coming, and in most synagogues, whoever is leading the singing, if they have a good voice, they're going to use a melody, they're going to use the melody of a Purim song to sing part of the blessing for the announcing of the month. So even though Purim, the holiday is not gonna be for quite a while yet, as soon as you even announce that Adar is going to be starting, we're already starting to think Purim. And then of course, all the women are like, oh. as soon as you're thinking about Purim, that means Pesach is coming and like, oh my gosh, I have to start getting ready for Pesach. So luckily it's two, two Adars, so we have more time. But we we don't wait until Adar, and we don't, we don't wait until the second Adar, and we certainly don't wait till Purim in order to have Purim, which means that this Shabbos with Parshas Yitro and with the blessing of the new month of Adar is bringing in a Purim concept for us. So what's the connection? Going back to that Amalek's hand is on the case Yah, is on God's throne. And we just went through that gematria, the case Yah is equal to 95. What else does that equal? That 95 is the gematria of Haman, Haman. He, Mem, Nun, He is five, Mem is 40, Nun is 50. So we have 95 is Haman. His hand is also on case Yah. His hand is on the throne of God and with his attempt also, just like Hamas, to wipe out and destroy every man, woman, and child who is Jewish. So that's called having your hand on the throne. What's the antidote to that? This is the Jewish people coming together and being unified, focusing their attention on the unity, the echadness, the oneness of God, the oneness of Torah, the oneness of the Jewish people, that's our tactic. And when the Jewish people do that, then those enemies weaken at least and disappear forever, hopefully, ultimately. So we have uh, this week's Parsha, starting from last week of the end of, uh, the end of Bishalach, of Amalek being there, we see that Amalek is weakened because it says that Joshua was able, verse 13, back on page 393, Joshua weakened Amalek and its people with the sword's blade. Okay, so it says he weakened them, but he did not destroy them. As we know, he was not destroyed, he was just weakened. And we have until this time, we still have that force is with us. But when Amalek is weakened, says, what happens? So there's a seesaw relationship. If Amalek is weakened, it allows the Jewish people to rise, to become stronger. 
And again, this is not like we're trying to be in charge of anybody. It's not triumphalistic, except that it is the triumph of good over evil. So the Jewish people rise up. So what happens in the right after this battle with Amalek? That's why I said that sometimes we forget that these two, these parshas are really back to back here. The very next thing that happens, turn the page, chapter 18, verse 1, Yitro, the minister of Midian, the father-in-law of Moshe, heard everything that God did to Moshe and to Israel's people, that Hashem had taken Israel out of Egypt, and he came and he comes with, with Zipporah and with his sons, and he comes and he wants to, and blesses God, and he comes and wants to be part with the Jewish people. It says, what happens when Amalek goes down and the Jewish people are strengthened? It says, two things happen. We see an, a not just a spiritual increase and in qualitative spiritual increase of the Jewish people. We see a quantitative increase in the Jewish people. And so we have Yitro joined in. He added to it. So interestingly, and very kind of peculiarly, how do we say that word? In the Megillah as well, after the defeat of Haman, it says that there were people in Persia who converted to Judaism. So let's take a look at that. Um, if you have a Tanakh, I don't know if you want to turn to it or not, but if you have the Chumash, we're going to turn to it. And I'll give you the page. Hold on one second. Um, page 1259. Page 1259 is the Megillah, uh, which is at the back of your Chumash. And chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. It's kind of in the middle. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, it's right after the bold writing, if you have the, the stone Chumash. It says, Mordechai, you see that in bold. Mordechai left the king's presence clad in royal apparel of turquoise and white with a large gold crown, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have the famous line in verse 16 that we say as part of Havdalah, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And what comes right after that? Likewise, in every province and in every city, whenever the king's command and his decree reached, the Jews had gladness and joy, a feast and a holiday. And moreover, many from among the people of the land professed themselves Jews for the fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. It says people wanted to convert and be, join the Jewish people. Now, this is interesting for us to note because Jewish people are never looking for converts. We don't consider like, oh, yay, now we won. We got people to convert. We discourage people con converting. So why do we care and why is it mentioned? So the reason it's mentioned is because that's the equation. Amalek goes down. The Jewish people's honor goes up. And when that happens, more people join in. Uh, hold on a second. Is Amalek the story that every man said were to be destroyed? Yes. Are you talking about that we're supposed to destroy Amalek? We're supposed to destroy Amalek because they wanted to destroy us. It's pure hatred. We're supposed to wipe that out. And that was King Saul. Um, that was how he lost his kingship. When King Saul right. had his kingship established, he was supposed to wipe out Amalek, and he did not. Um, he, he did kill Saul. Yes, he kept, um, he kept um, King Agag and some of the sheep available. And um, Sam, God said to Samuel, I'm taking the kingship away from him and giving it to a more deserving person. And then it goes to David, to King David. So, yes. So, so where are you in the, um, in the Megillah, please? What in the verse? Megillah, we just read chapter eight. Oh, eight. Yes. Chapter eight. And it was the end of verse 17. Verse 17 is a long verse. Moreover, many from among the people and professed themselves Jews. People wanted to join the Jewish people. So there is this kind of thing that happens that's, that we have to understand repeats itself in history. That there's always, there will always be a qualitative and a quantitative increase in the number of Jewish people and the people identifying Jewishly, taking on Torah, observing mitzvahs. The same thing happened after the Holocaust when the Nazis were defeated, and the same thing happened after 1967 in Israel. You see like this, you know, burgeoning of yeshivas and people, that's that's where you get the term, the Baal Shuvah, people who return to Judaism and start practicing, and they're poor, 
befuddled parents are like, where do these people come from? Like, I didn't raise a child to be religious. And like, I, what happened? What did I do wrong? So all these crazy kind of perspectives. So it says this happened after these periods, after the defeat of these powers that were there to destroy us, we see this surge. So what people are talking about now is with the absolutely devastating destruction that has happened in Israel over the past few months, what will we act? What are we actually anticipating? A soaring increase, which we're already seeing amongst the soldiers and secular people as we speak. As we speak, most people, if you are being destroyed, want to hide and get out of the get out of the, you know, the picture as fast as possible. People are coming into the picture and identifying Jewish like now what's the now what people want? Let's see. Let's see, we've got seat seat and to fill in. And oh, people, this is a new thing. I don't know if the army's gonna go for this. Our patches, like we want Mashiach, like now to like where you can put that on your it's not exactly your regulation uh you know thing that's supposed to be there, but I think that's pretty funny. So that you have like the people who before in Israel where there was all this hue and cry of like, you know, the extremist religious people who are just messianic. Now you have like these secular soldiers who want like, we want Mashiach like on their lapels or on their shoulders. So we don't even know what's going on, but there is some tremendous shift because every time the Jewish people go through something like this, and God forbid, like we've been through so many different things, it results in an upsurge. Instead of a depression, it has the opposite effect. Even in Egypt, when the Jewish people were being oppressed by Pharaoh, it says the births multiplied. The more they oppressed us, the more babies we had. Usually population goes down, births go down when there are times like that. People are like, I don't want to have any part of it. That goes up. So we defy explanation about how the Jews were. So we went from Amalek and then we get Yitro comes in and then we're going to go to Mount Sinai and stand at Sinai and get Torah. And one of the images that is so beautiful to think about is we know how did the Jewish people stand at Mount Sinai? It says with everybody knows that we stood, we said, Ke'ishechad b'levechad. We stood as one person with one heart, that there was total achdut, there was total unity. And that that is a prerequisite for the unity of God's name, and the unity of Torah, the unity of the Jewish people, it's all one thing. It all has to be brought together. So, and now we know that we can do it because we've seen ourselves come together in unprecedented ways and that we can have this. So the image that is coming to my mind this time, it always comes to mind, but even more so this year, is every synagogue throughout the world is going to be reading this Parsha this week. And even the synagogues that follow the triennial cycle and only read a third of the Parsha always make an exception for Parsha Yitro, and they always read the giving of the Ten Commandments. They don't wait like three years to read that. They always read it. So they arrange it, which means that Jewish people from one end of the spectrum to the next, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Yemenite, Russian, the, the, Everybody is going to be there, and the custom is to stand for that, and we are all going to stand at Sinai. We are not reading it, and the reason we stand is because we're not reading it. We are re-experiencing it. So this Shabbos is the giving of Torah. We have a holiday called Shavuot that commemorates it, but when we read it in the Torah is considered more real than the holiday that we celebrate it. So this Shabbos is where we are going to accept Torah. And what do we say? We're going to say the famous words, Na'aseh v'nishma. Na'aseh v'nishma. What does that mean, Na'aseh v'nishma? Na'aseh we will do, and nishma we will listen. Pay attention. So learn something fascinating. And um, I don't know who it was from. It may have been from Rabbi Gladstein or it may have been from Rabbi Torsky. 
it wasn't for me, who said, interestingly, there's something else that happened when the Jewish people said, not a sevenishma. It says, angels came down and gave every Jewish person two crowns. You got two crowns. So someone said like, what does that even mean? Why would you need two crowns? Like if you're the queen, so what do you have like your weekday crown and your holiday crown or your dress up crown? It's like, what does that mean? He said, no, they got wore two crowns. Now to me, I have to say that sounds kind of silly. Like, why do you need two crowns? It's like the crown of Torah. Why don't you just have one? It says, we got one for each word. The crown of for Na'aseh and the crown for Nishma. But why do you get a crown for each one of those? So here's this beautiful connection. And we have talked about ideas related to this before. Remember when we said that before the Jewish people accepted the Torah, God went around to all the other nations and asked them if they would take it. And they said, what's in it? And when he said what was in it, they're like, not interested. So, so there is a problem with the fact that our closest relatives did not take it. There's a big problem that Yishmael didn't take it. And there's a big problem that the descendants of Esau didn't take it because that's the rest of the family. So if those two people didn't take it and their descendants didn't take it, there's almost as if there's something missing. And we had to take on their portion. Just like when Jacob gets the birthright from Esau, it says he takes on the responsibility and he gets the qualities, he gets everything for, for both. It says this is going to happen at Sinai. Look at the words na'aseh and nishma. The word na'aseh is related to the word, the root of that is aleph, samech, I'm not samech, aleph, sin, hey, oseh. It's the root of the word esav. The word na'aseh means we will do what Esav should have done. We will take his role and we get a crown for accepting like basically his part that he didn't want. And, and nishma, the root of that is shema, which is the root of Yishmael, of God heard him. And we say we take Ishmael also. So na'asev and nishma, we are basically saying, we will take the responsibility. And with responsibility also comes the, the um, you know, the crown is heavy. If someone said, you wouldn't really want to wear a crown because with all those encrusted jewels, it's actually kind of heavy on your head. A crown represents responsibility and authority. It, re it represents the commitment and, and taking on that responsibility, okay? So we take it on. So we got both crowns. We got the crown of Naaseh and we got the crown of Nishma. We got the crown of Esav and we got the crown of Yishmael. However, we do not end up getting to keep those crowns. When do we lose them? We lose them at, uh, I said, had to say that, at the sin of the golden calf. Okay. And specifically, God is going to tell us to take off our crowns. He actually says, take off your jewelry. So, which is kind of fascinating, but let's turn to that for a moment, just so you can see it inside the text on page 503. We're going to leave the Megillah for right now for a moment. Go back to page 503. Page 503 is Parsha Kitisa, which is the Parsha of the golden calf. It's Exodus chapter 33, verse five. This is after the sin of the golden calf. Hashem said to Moshe, say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. If I send among you, I may annihilate you in an instant. And now remove your jewelry from yourself and I shall know what I shall do to you. So the children of Israel were stripped of their jewelry from Mount Horeb. The Hor Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai. It's like, off those crowns go, off those crowns go. So very, very interestingly, if you look at many Passover Haggadahs for the Birkat Hamazon, the grace after meals, it has a very interesting addition. It says, it talks about the righteous people. It says like, Harachaman, have mercy. The tzaddikim are going to be sitting, and what does it say? Yoshvim ba'atrotehem, with their crowns on, basking in the whatever of the Shekhinah of the divine presence. It's like, what crowns are those? Those are those crowns. It's like, we want our crowns back. 
think this is also part of the reason why we do not wear jewelry on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, which is the commemoration of the sin of the golden calf, our forgiveness for us, like you don't come with your jewelry on because you're supposed to take it off. So we don't come with the jewelry, the jewelry of those crowns that we got for Na'aseh Venishma, taking on that responsibility. When we take the responsibility, we have our crowns, we create a unity, we take Amalek's hands off of God's throne. We get rid of Haman. We get the full spelling of God's name. We get the full spelling of the throne. Everything is right with the world. And we take on more Torah. And as we take on Torah, so you can think of this as this is a dance um, where you can improve any of the things, any place along the way to make it better. So if the Jewish people's unity is one leg and Torah learning is another leg, and the unity of God is the other part, affirming God's unity and oneness and achdus of unity of the Jewish people and strengthening the Torah says, this dynamic triangle is what creates the peace and prosperity and success for the Jewish people. When we get to Mount Sinai and accept the Torah, we have the opportunity to reaffirm who else reaffirms this is in the time of the Megillah. It says of the Jewish people, Kimu Vakiblu. They reaffirmed and took on the Torah that they had become lax in. Because if you remember Haman, what does he say to Achishverus about why it'd be a great idea to destroy the Jewish people at this point? He says specifically that they are, there is a certain people who says, uh, it says, the English says certain, but it's the word in Hebrew is Am Echad. There is a nation that's supposed to be Echad, but instead it's Mifuzar u Instead it is scattered and separated. So if they're scattered and separated, guess what that means? They are completely vulnerable. God is not going to help them. They're lax in their Torah. They have no Achdus. This is the time to come in. This is not unlike the calculation that Hamas made. They are divided. They're all over the place. They're like this. I mean, who knows what their calculations are sick, but there is a, a vulnerability and Haman says it right there for us. So what's the prerequisite for receiving the Torah? Achdus, that the Jewish people come together, that we were there, Vayichan Sham, that we encamp there as one person with one heart. So as we're visualizing this Shabbos, when you're in the synagogue and they're reading the Torah and they're reading the Ten Commandments and we're reenacting this to know and to really, really feel and daven for the achdus of the Jewish people. Because it's only when we are like that that God can give us a full measure of what we're entitled to have, the spiritual strength, the physical strength, all of it is dependent on that. When we do that, and this is this is the week to really do that, then this is the time to, to focus in that way. I mean, the truth is, any time is the time to focus, but specifically Parsha Yitro, because we are reenacting this exactly. And we're hearing a prequel to Purim. Remember Purim, remember what happened Centuries later, when you fell apart, what, how, how terrible it was. And you know, when you were growing up and you thought, I guess people, I don't know if Jewish people were ever so naive to think, oh, nobody would ever want to just kill everybody for no reason. It must be because they want their money. They want their power. They want their land. They want their whatever. It's like, no, no, no reason. We just want to destroy you. And it, we are always looking for some reason that people have a reason, but there is no reason. And once we get that through our heads, then we'll know what we're up against and we need to know what the antidote is. The antidote is the achdut of the Jewish people so that we can strengthen God's name, so we can strengthen Torah. And when God's name is together, that means that there will be clarity in the world and everyone will see it. Right now, why, why are people so confused? is because just like the Jewish people are in exile, it's as if God's name is in exile too, that the Torah is in exile. It means that there's not clarity. It's not percolating down to the world. 
in a significant enough way. But in the end, it will be. How do we know that in the end, it will be okay? So this week's Haftorah comes from the prophet Isaiah, and your Christian friends may be more familiar with it than you are or your Jewish friends, because it's the part of Isaiah that they use, Christians use, to say that this is the prediction of the coming of Jesus. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the Haftorah here, and that is going to be, hold on a second. Get it. Um, page eleven fifty six. That's where all the half Torahs are in the back. This is the prophet Isaiah, and we're going to look at the. This is the end of the the end of the half Torah. So this is the prophet Isaiah, and it is chapter. Hold on one second. Chapter nine, verse six. But let's look at chapter 9, verse 5 first. And you'll recognize this. Maybe somebody tried to, I know somebody tried me several times to convert me and show me that in Isaiah, it says like that there's going to be a child born and it's going to be the Prince of Peace and it's going to be Jesus. For a child has been born to us. A son has been given to us and the authority will rest on his shoulders. He who was wondrous advisor, mighty God, eternal father shall give him the name Prince of Peace. You ever heard of a cheat churches that are called Prince of Peace? Yep. To him who will be great in authority and have peace without limit upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and sustain it through justice and righteousness from now to eternity, the zealousness of Hashem, masters of master of legions will accomplish this. This is the Haftorah that talks about the coming of Mashiach the coming of the Redeemer. But it's not talking about Jesus. Who is it talking about? So it actually is talking about a specific person and his name you might not even know is Tzitkiyahu. Tzitkiyahu was a king, a descendant of King David, who was the most righteous king who actually was supposed to be Mashiach. He was supposed to be Mashiach. He had been designated to be Mashiach, but he failed he failed in a test, in a couple of tests. But one of the tests he failed in is that there was a um, Sancheriv. Um, I don't know where, where he's from. Sancheriv came to attack and was going to destroy the Jewish people, completely outnumbered the Jews, and God performs a miracle and like wipes out the entire army. And Sancheriv then runs for his life like a real coward. And it was a complete miracle. They didn't even fight them. The whole thing, they just like disappeared and died. It says, what was Sitkiahu's response? It should have been, what do we Jewish people do when you have a miracle, an overt miracle, and you are grateful and you see the hand of God and all that? It says, you're supposed to sing. You're supposed to have shira. You're supposed to sing like the Jewish people sang at the splitting of the sea. And he didn't. Anything like, is that all? It's like, no, that's huge. If you didn't see it and you didn't, you saw something and you didn't say something, you're not the one. So it says that he lost, he lost it, the, the ability to be the uh, redeemer. However, this is who it was, it was referring to because Isaiah was the prophet at the time of King Sitkiahu. However, there is a hint to it that it was supposed to have been, it was supposed to have been, how do we know it was supposed to have been? For this, you need to look at the Hebrew. You're not going to see it in the English. If you go into the Hebrew, you'll see that there will be a word close to the end, um, the, the first word in verse six, next to the vav. You'll see that there's a word in brackets or in parentheses, and it says lamar be, and the word marbe, which means to be great. Okay, like from rav, like harbe, marbe. And in brackets, it's going to say the same word. It's going to say, like, why are you telling me this twice? But for those of you who know the Hebrew letters, and we're going to look at them in just a moment, the second letter in that word is a mem, le marbe. In the parentheses, it's written that mem is written as what's called a final mem, a final mem, but it's not the final letter, it's the second letter, right? You see that, Carol? So Limarbet, it is written as a 
as a final mem. So what's a final mem doing as you, a second you, letter? You said in the parentheses, the final mem is the word that's not in the parentheses. Am I right? Um, the word is in the parentheses. Mine is in the stone. Okay. Yeah, I have the. But the. Yeah, I found it. Yeah. But where where are, are you? It's two of them. It's the first. There should be two words that look exactly the same that say Le Marbe. Yeah, I got it. So, but one of them, one of them is written with the mem as a final mem, but it's the second letter of the word. It's it's I'm underlined. Final, yeah. It's underlined in yours? Okay. Yeah. So it, it's to indicate mm -hmm. it is written as a, in the scroll, it is written as a final mem. Now, why is this is the only place in the entire, entire Bible where you have a final letter written in the middle. It's like, why is that there? So I've seen that before. I didn't think anything of it. Instead, it's really telling us something. It says, the final mem, like all of the final letters, are connected to the world to come and the coming of Mashiach. Because what happens when we talk about when Mashiach comes, like what happens? What's going to happen? This is this, one of the things that the main yeah, thing that's going to happen is that everything is going to get straightened out. All the gaps are going to close, the gaps in understanding, everything is going to work out. The regular mem, and now for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to try to share my screen. So bear with me and see if I can do this. Um, okay, hold on a second. We'll see if I can do this. Oh, and what page are you on? Um, I am on page of of the Chumash. I'm on page eleven fifty six. I'm on eleven fifty six, and it's the the first word on verse uh, verse six. Yes. Ellen, what about the Tanakh? In the Tanakh, then I don't know. I, I, I have it here. It's page 968. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to find this here. Hold on a second. I had it set up before. Ugh, let me try and find it here. Okay, how can I make this go away? This thing needs to move. Ah, there we go. It did move. Yay. Okay. Okay. Do you see this chart here of Hebrew letters mm -hmm. showing up for you? Okay. Yeah. So you know, these are just different ways of writing the letters. We're going to start here, this Aleph, Bet, Gimel, it goes all the way through. And as we know, all the letters, because we've talked about this a lot, all the letters have gematrias. So for example, you can see that the letter Chet here has a gematria of eight, right? So all the letters have numerical equivalents. The very last letter, do you see my arrow there? Can you guys see my arrow there? Okay, the last letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet is a, is a Tav. And the gematria of a Tav is 400. Now, that's kind of weird. That's kind of like a weird place to end. That doesn't, I don't know, does it sound like something's missing? Like it should go to at least a 500 or something. So the fact of the matter is that the final letters are the rest of the numbers. This is a final chaf, and it equals 500. This is a final mem, it equals 600. Final nun equals 700. Final fe equals 800. And final tsaadi equals 900. Now you might think, well, there's a little something missing. Couldn't you just take it all the way up to 1,000? So 1,000 actually goes back to Aleph because the word Aleph is the same spelling as the word Aleph. So in Hebrew, Aleph means okay. thousand, okay? You can always remember it because like, um, think of an elephant that weighs a thousand pounds, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like Aleph. Okay, an elephant weighs a thousand pounds, Aleph is a thousand. So these are the rest of the numbers here. Does we don't, when we usually do gematria, we don't use these numbers. Like when I, when we do a gematria for a word, we usually just tend to use the word, the gematrias for the regular letters. But the truth is, in the end of time, the gematrias are going to be expanded to include 
these numbers as well. So what else do you notice about these final letters? Do you notice that they have something, most of them have something in common? You see something that you notice? They're longer. Exactly, exactly. They almost all go below the line. This is the final, all the other letters you notice, they all are above the line. Actually, there's one that's an exception. Well, the mem, the mem is not above, below the line. Exactly, the mem is not below the line. All the yeah. other ones are. So first we're gonna talk about the other letters. All the letters that are below the line, it says this, do you see how they all, they all straightened out. So this letter here is a final chaf. I'm gonna show you compared to a regular chaf. See the regular chaf looks like a backward C. If you straighten out its leg, it becomes a final chaf. Now let's go to the nun. This is the final nun. Let's look at a regular nun. A regular nun is here. If you straighten out its bottom and elongate it, it becomes this one. This is the, this is the final fe. And here's, here's the regular fe. Regular fe is right here. If you straighten out the bottom and lengthen it, you get this. And then sadi. And the sadi is if you straighten this out, you get this. So all of them are about straightening out and coming down. It says that there will be clarity and everything will straighten out. All of the kinks, all of the bumps, all of the things that are not right are all going to get straightened out. And that these are the final letters, which means that they are when they occur at the end of the word, representing the end of time. So, so they are connected to the coming of Mashiach. At the end of time, there will be this straightening out, this total connection between above the line, like in heavens and below the line down here on earth. And there'll be, it will all be straightened out. The exception is the mem. So what's different about the mem? Here's the mem, the final mem. And the regular mem is here. It says the regular mem is open and the final mem is closed. It says that that represents also the closing of all of the gaps. Everything closes up. Everything that was like open and not finished will be closed and finished. Everything that's crooked will be straightened out. It says all of these end letters have to do with coming of Mashiach. So that when we see this final mem here, which occurs in this week's Haftorah, in the middle of the word, it is a hint that this is about the coming of Mashiach, that it because it's a closed mem when things are going to be finalized. Because really what should have happened with the giving of Torah, had we not had the sin of the golden calf, had we not done that, then we would have gone on that Mo Moshe would have been Mashiach. We would have gone into the land of Israel. We would have built the temple and that would have been plan A. It did not work like that. And so we've had multiple versions of our story going through, but we hold on even by looking at the letters and saying, I, co I see at the end, at the end of the day, at the end of the word, the final is going to be it's going to be the coming of Mashiach. Now, I want to offer something that this is me, Ellen Hutt, and this isn't anybody else saying this. Maybe there is somebody who does say it, but I haven't seen it. This letter here is a kuf. It's the only regular letter that goes below the line. Do you see this right here? It's the one that equals 100. 100 is kuf. What is kuf connected to? It says it's connected this is me saying this, it's connected to the word Kedusha of holiness. That when we have Kedusha and we make things holy, we actually succeed in creating this straight part. We actually succeed. It's almost like a kuf is a wannabe final letter. In fact, a lot of people when they're learning to read Hebrew, don't get this one right because they don't notice this line that goes below here. 
right? It's confusing. People want to say it as a cough, but it's really a kuf. They sound alike too. So what I'm offering is that the kadusha, the holiness, that when we are, when we sanctify things in our life through the through the mitzvot and through everything that we do, we are basically bringing a hint, a touch, a small amount of Mashiach into our lives today. So we say about Shabbos that it is a semblance, it is a touch of the world to come because it is Shabbos Kodesh. It is the holy Sabbath. Anything that is holy and that we sanctify and make holy, we are in effect bringing it into the Mashiach dimension of reality. And that doesn't always go smoothly in today's world or in any world that the Jewish people have ever lived in. But when we do that, then we will have that kind of awareness and we create that in our life. I think it's not an accident that the word for end, like the end of days, is called kates, which is two letters, the kuf, which goes below the line, and the final tzadi, which goes below the line. And the kuf is basically at the end, it will all be revealed, it'll all be straightened out, it'll all be completed, and everything will be as it is supposed to be. Hashem's name, as we say at the end of Aleinu, will be put together, not just us saying it, but the world will see the oneness of God, and we will see peace and prosperity, health, happiness, joy, and everything that Mashiach is supposed to bring to the world. The Jewish people are the leaders of this. But again, and always, we are not meant to be the only ones. This isn't like a party for one here. This is the party for the whole world that will eventually come to this. It is an uphill, it's an uphill battle. It's an uphill battle. When Moshe, when the Jewish people were fighting Amalek, Yehoshua, Joshua was down fighting, but Moshe was up on the mountain with Kor and Aaron holding up his arms to give him strength so the Jewish people could look up and gain strength because we need inspiration. The battle against Amalek, the battle against the everything that is the antithesis of Kedusha, listen to what our enemies say. The Jew, why do they think they're going to win? Because they say they love life, meaning the Jewish people, and we celebrate death. You don't get any more opposite of Kedusha than that. And this is not us saying, being mean and saying mean things about people. This is what they say about themselves. And sometimes you think like, are we the most gullible, idiotic people? It's like, you know what? As I said in my email I sent out, I have never been more proud and grateful. Me too. Jewish, to have the Torah as the framework for our life because everyone has a framework from which they operate, whether they have identified it exactly or not. Everyone has a framework. It's like every computer has, has, has software that is embedded in it that helps process the information. It's not possible unless you are, your brain is completely not co connected at all. Everyone has a framework that they operate with and in to evaluate, judge, process, and react to the world around them. And the Torah is the one that gives us the healthiest, most accurate, aligned with reality framework that a person can have. All we have to do is look and see the results. I read something that was interesting about why there are so many students on campuses who are finding themselves aligned with Hamas and even with the Houthis, which you can't even fathom that. What, what is wrong with people? These are smart people. It says, honestly, and this sounds like very like right wing, whatever. People don't have religion because that's like Americans now define themselves like I, I'm a nothing, I'm a nothing. Nobody is a nothing because human beings are actually designed to believe in something. And if you don't pick the right thing to believe in, you will fall for anything. 
you will fall for anything, then you're in big danger. So it's interesting that Yitro symbolizes the person who converted after exploring every other framework for understanding reality. It wasn't like Ruth. Ruth converted doing to seeing like the lifestyle of Naomi. And she was like, I love God. I believe in God. I want to be part of your people. Yitro says was an intellectual. He explored all of the different ways of thinking about reality. And he came to the conclusion of Judaism through that, that that's the path. When you have people who have nothing, nobody sticks with nothing. They will then become gullible and they will become easy victims for anything that comes along. And they will believe anything. And it is unbelievable what you can get people to do. I, I saw something like a film of people talking on campus saying it's good to give your life for the Palestinian cause. These are Americans at a American university. It's like, what are you even talking about? But just remember, the Nazis did the same thing. Chinese did the same thing. Japanese did the same thing. This has been going on since the dawn of humanity, that if one does not choose actively choose the framework that they want to operate from in their life, they will be a victim of anything that blows their way. So thank God we are Jewish. We have inherited a framework that thank God many of us grew up with or have adopted in, in our lives and grow with it. And to the ability to have something that gives us a litmus test of what's good, what's bad, what's right, and what's wrong, where we used to think it was obvious and that anybody would be able to see it, is clearly not true. Clearly not true. So thank God we are Jewish. Thank God we have the Torah. We should only merit to have the miracles of Purim start immediately, if not before this Shabbos Mavorchim of of Rosh Chodesh Adar, which doesn't even in fact then begin until next Friday. So we get like a whole week and we get two Adars. So we have plenty of time for a lot, a lot of miracles to happen, which we are experiencing. We are experiencing miracles and our job is to say Shira so that we are supposed to really pay attention to all the miracles that are happening the near misses, everything that's happening here in our own lives as well, and to express gratitude that when we do that, we make ourselves worthy of more miracles coming our way. And that time, then we will be able, no longer will Haman's hand be on God's throne and God's name will be unified. The echadness, the unity of the Jewish people will be reflected in unity of Torah, the unity of God's name and the unity of all humanity and being able to fulfill their greatest personal potential. When we see the wasted potential, I'm sure you've seen the way that they uh, designed those tunnels is really, they are unbelievable feats of engineering. It was amazing. This wasn't like, you know, they, you know, scraped dirt away and made a tunnel. This is incredible work, incredible work. And what a complete waste of intellectual, financial, emotional, every kind of resource down the tubes. It's the opposite of startup nation. It is startup destruction. And it's they could not be anything more opposite. And to have something so close in our midst is really absolutely mind boggling. So know that we are standing in the light and that we're standing on the side of right and read and look at and think about anything you need to, to make sure your focus stays where it should be and stand tall this Shabbos when we stand at Sinai and receive the Torah once again, and hopefully receive our crowns of Naaseh Venishma. Have a wonderful Shabbos. Thank you. Everyone be well. Thank you you, Thank you so much. Oh, rescued wonderful. today. Thank you. Um, what was that, Mar What was that, Marsha? The hostages should be rescued today.
Amen. All, the, Amen. all yeah. the slaves, whether they're Jews or not slaves, all of them. Everybody. Because they're very cruel, cruel people. And they, they, they take, they still deal in slavery. Yes, they do. It's yes, this, they it, do. They it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. It all is. Right. So Everyone be on, well. And all start of this singing, be Start well. singing those Purim songs and think about what your costume is going to be. <laughs> okay. Everyone shalom. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Bye. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks. Bye. Bye. I mean.